Dear listener, you may believe that the holidays are a time of good cheer and mirth, and that every song you sing is one filled with joy, and if you wish to continue thinking that, I suggest you travel somewhere else. Perhaps a story of Santa Claus and good boys and girls drinking eggnog and playing with toys all through the winter solstice. You will not find any fairy tales of happiness here. For every merry Christmas that exists, there is also one filled with darkness and depression. These are the tales that I have come to offer. You may think you know what it is like to hear such stories, and that you are prepared to listen. But my research has found that often, when we sort through accounts, a deeper, darker understanding of our own reality is found. I'm a historian, and it's my task to understand why certain experiences are retold generation after generation. Only minor details changed here and there. Some become legends. But clearly, there is truth amid all their wounds. And when these people told them to me, I knew it wasn't just for a good scare. They had lived through it. I started with the intention of merely gathering facts, but now I feel compelled to learn more and I hope that you will do as well. I dare not think that my duty should be anything other than to recount them now to you. The Feast of Souls. It was 1987, near the city that once was called Harbor Bay. It was a feast that many claimed would rival the Passover itself, Nearly 500 people came to our little quaint town to celebrate. There was imported wine and cheese, ham and baked goods, everything a man could need to fill his belly and party the night away. As the night carried on, the festival continued. More joined in until not a scrap of food was left. Father told us that the mayor ordered all to come to the town hall and take part in a grander festival there one that would ring in the new year with resounding triumph. By midnight, the revelry had died down, and the partygoers were exhausted in the old building. The streets were empty, only littered with footprints and wasted food. And then, a knock came to the door. Father Strom, a devout man of the cloth, went to answer and never returned. Then an hour passed, and another knock came. This time, his wife went to the door, and the same thing happened. The other partygoers likely would never know about their disappearances were it not for the screams that came from the square. It was enough to wake the whole assembly. Raya Claude, a girl of no more than twelve years of age at the time, ran to the door and flung it open wide, peering into the misty early morning dawn as she went after the screams. Father Strom and his wife were not hard to find. They were dancing in the town square, but not the way that ordinary couples might. Something had infected them. A madness of some kind. Their bare feet were swollen and bloody, a mindless trail circling around the statues in the square. But some claim that the statues danced too. These structures were crafted to resemble angels, long-gone saints that would protect the city from evil, but that night they appeared as demons, holding strings over Strom and his wife the way a marionette maestro would. The ones that saw the dancing felt compelled to join in. An endless, insane fray of music and mayhem ensued. Raya claimed that the statues laughed as the people continued to dance, but their merriment did not end even when the last person collapsed to the cobblestone street. The great old ones moved from their perches of stone to the ground below, their mighty marble wings shielding most from seeing what would happen. Raya hid behind a house to get a better peek, to view a nightmare. 
The gargoyles began to feast on the people that were still wailing and chanting, their dead eyes looking straight at Raya, accusingly as she shuddered. They tore apart the bodies like dogs that had been begging for scraps, the screams joining a church choir for Christmas morning worship. Somehow the young girl found the courage to run. She didn't really know where to go except to escape the haunting sight of the monsters. But the angels did not stop when they had eaten all those poor victims. They wanted to go hunting. By this time, Raya had sounded the warning to the outskirts of town, near the pubs and the taverns that were at the riverside. Of course, the drunkards only laughed and jeered at her and their foolish, harsh mockery only allowed the hunting party of the undead to find them with little effort. The first to die there was a man named Malroy Smith. Raya said that he was stronger than an ox, but the angels were able to crush him like a piece of paper. They ripped his innards out and strung his intestines like harp cords. Then they played a haunting siren call get the others to leave the tavern. Raya said she watched half the town go to their deaths that night. When asked why she was spared, Raya offered me a jar where she kept her bloodied ears. She showed me the scars on her head and explained how she thought quickly for her own survival. Chop them off, she said. It was the only way to be free of their endless call. And now every year she travels to the old ghost town, to lay sacrifice to the statues and appease the dead, hoping that they never return. They joined us that night because we forgot to make a meal for them, she explained. It's not a tradition that we can simply forget, she warned. I've promised her I will do my best to keep it alive. But something tells me the ghosts that haunt her every waking moment will have no trouble doing that themselves. Dear listeners, some of you have asked, and rightly so, what sparked my interest in the uncanny surrounding this blessed time of year. It might surprise you to learn that I am not a devout Christian, or even celebrate the holiday at all. Digging into cultural phenomena has always been a hobby of mine, and paganism even more so. Something about leaving no stone unturned fascinated me. Nothing about our modern Christmas is anywhere near the practices of old so it seems only proper for someone to set the record straight, so to speak. It may not be the answer you hoped for. The truth often shatters the comforts of lies. The Unexpected Guest Lisa Landry often held parties at her estate before her death, and Christmas was no exception. Her guests were the upper crust, the well-to-do of local society, and Henry Satin was no different. The way he put it, if you wanted to matter at all in society, you needed to be at the Landry Christmas party. Everyone was dressed to impress for the occasion. Satin, a business partner with the local community theater, said that he was there to land a promotion. His manager, the ever-boisterous Ian Munch, was weaving about the party flirting with anything breathing. He could almost smell the pompous attitudes of all that attended, Henry explained. To get an invitation was compared to a golden ticket. But this was no fictional factory for children to run around. It was a statement of success for those that Landry deemed worthy. No one there showed an ounce of poverty. As you might expect then, it was a bit of a shock when Lucas, the butler, reported a homeless man roaming about the driveway. There was a commotion near the main hall as people speculated who it could be. The Landry's estate was far from the main highways, 
a private road that could only be accessed through a gate down the hill. There was no way that Alistair, Landry's chief of security, would have let some vagabond just roam up here. And then Henry told me that one of the guests had an idea. It was going to be late, and the temperature was dropping rapidly, so Emily Richardson suggested that we let the man in for a warm meal. Well, it, it didn't go over so well. Who knows what sort of disease that tramp might be carrying, some said. Others suggested that the only reason the man was there was to steal from Liza. After all, her items were worth millions. While they were debating, somehow the man found a way inside to the crowd. Henry said that no one could really recall exactly how the homeless man had gotten inside, simply that he now was there. The crowd seemed to disperse as he moved towards the main master staircase, his breath a toxic cloud of booze and meth. Henry claimed, however, that this man did not seem to be an ordinary drunk. It was something else entirely. The air had suddenly gotten a lot colder when he arrived, and the crowd quieter. I think we all could sense that whatever this man was doing here, his intentions were not pure. Then the homeless man pointed a finger accusingly towards Landry, and called her by her maiden name. Some said that she fainted, but Henry told me otherwise. She was standing on the balcony, overlooking the party when this... This man just gave her the death stare. It made her panic, and she tried to run, but somehow her feet fell from under her. She... She toppled over the banister, and... She... She fell to the stairs below. I'll never forget that sickening sound when her body broke on the marble steps. Music stopped when everyone realized that the master of the house was dead. And suddenly, the homeless man was gone. Henry said that he was the one that phoned the police. And everyone corroborated a different story for them. It was an accident, they told authorities. Not a soul mentioned the homeless man or the the vendetta that he seemed to have for Landry. Henry seemed content with his version of events, despite the fact that it left so much untold. But you must know by now my curiosity got the better of me, and I had to go see the house for myself. Where decadence and splendor stood, it's just a monument to failure now. The gates of iron were overgrown with kudzo, and I found a way through easily. The ground felt like they were whispering to me, telling me which way to go. The police tape was still there, the house now abandoned and boarded up. With Landry gone, no parties would be held here anymore. Inside, I shone a flashlight to push past cobwebs and dust, search for clues that would give me an idea of who this uninvited guest was. I recall the detail that Henry mentioned the man spoke of Landry's maiden name. It made me choose to climb the stairs and search for her belongings. What had happened to her family before she started to throw such lavish parties? Word on the street said that she had inherited all of it from her husband, a bad case of cancer that she had tended to dutifully. I pulled out drawers, pushed aside bookshelves, even turned over mattresses but it was barren. A sharp, stiff breeze floated through the house when I made my way back to the stairs. I had already guessed that I was going to be visited by my own visitor that unholy night. You're not going to find anything. She made every trace of me disappear years ago, the homeless man said. A better look at him told me that this was, in fact, Landry's husband. The photos on the mantle matched almost perfectly. 
But how could he be here if dead all those years ago? This is my house now, the spirit told me. I will be the one to host parties, he intoned as he pointed for me to leave. I didn't have the courage to ask the details of his life, for fear that he might choose to take my own. So I passed by the spectral visitor and I tipped my hat, vowing to never return. Since that time, I wondered if I had imagined the whole thing as an explanation for what Landry had done. And clearly, she had murdered her spouse and used the party as an excuse to commit suicide. This was the logical explanation. But then, Christmas looms closer, and I get a card in the mail. An invitation from the Landry estate to attend their party. A reminder of what ill fate will occur should others choose fame over family. Dear listener, by now you must have guessed that the reason I'm telling you all of these dreadful tales before a holy day isn't just for kicks and giggles. Hardly. I am no monster. I once lived a normal life before being forced to live out my days in the back of a restaurant, hide from local law enforcement. But you must think I lack some sanity devoting so much time to piecing together ghosts that no one else cares about. And maybe it's true. Maybe it's true that I lost a bit of my mind a long time ago. After all, the old paradox where I claim to not be insane wouldn't really work given half of my time is spent in graveyards. There's just something comforting that history offers me, which no living soul can do. The ghosts are where I find I am most at home. Left out in the cold. Simon and Raul were two Hispanic boys, praying for a white Christmas. Since they lived in rural country, where it was summer half the year, most of the grown-ups only scoffed and giggled when they brought up snow. But one winter, it really did. It was the worst on record, and it shut down power across the Tri-County area. The boys' parents were at a loss. They didn't have any food or power and didn't want their children to starve to death, so they put everyone in the back of their Chevy Suburban, and they started towards town. The family didn't make it farther than two miles down the road, when they encountered black ice. The vehicle fell into a ditch, and Mom and Dad were killed instantly. Somehow the boys were spared, and managed to crawl out to the highway and try to signal for help. But there weren't any other cars on the road, and their parents couldn't be brought back, so they only knew to keep trekking westward. The boys were trying to be strong, it was getting colder by the minute and darker. There wasn't a soul around. But there was someone, or something, the boys encountered that December night. As they moved through the road, they discovered the trees were down, and they had to find a way amid wood. With snow up to their ankles, the boys suddenly regretted all the times they had wished for, their only thought was to avoid frostbite or starvation. But soon enough, they were lost amid a blizzard. The fog made it hard for them to know for sure which direction to turn. Were they going in circles? And who could say? Then from amid the shroud of ice and cold, a figure emerged. He was clad in fine clothes, better than any Simon or Raoul had ever seen on a Christmas morning. And he was tall and well-built like a hunter. Clearly, these woods were where he spent most of his time. Are you boys lost? he asked. 
smoking a pipe and smiling towards them. Yes, sir, Simon said, doing his best not to chatter his teeth together. Well, it's a good thing that we met each other then, the man said, offering his hand in friendship. But Raoul was suspicious. Something about this stranger was off. Where had he come from? Where was he going? And why did he not show any signs of frost? Was the blizzard simply ignoring him? I know the answer now, but they are not the kind that you would hope for. The stranger was not a friendly face in the midst of their turmoil. He instead led them straight to their own demise. Somehow Simon convinced his brother that they should follow the hunter and offer their names. The old man said his name was Aster Smith from a nearby harbor town, and that he was just in the area for the reason to do some elk hunting. He talked their ear off as he guided them to a supposed rescue. But neither of the boys could have guessed that he was actually leading them to their doom. Eventually they reached a summit, and the boys realized they were farther from the road or home than ever before. Raoul tried to confront the man about it, but Aster had changed. He wasn't wearing a friendly face anymore. Instead, his appearance was ghastly, and his skin covered in boils. He made a high-pitched shriek, and somehow brought forth an axe from the mist. He severed Raoul first, cutting the boy's head off and giving his brother a chance to run. Or so Simon thought. The truth is, Aster was actually in the mood for a bit of sport. The ghost knew the poor boy couldn't find his bearings amid the blizzard, so he toyed with him for the next hour. The ghost took his brother's head along to, to dangle it and tease Simon about what would befall him. Ironically, though, the ghost didn't get to kill Simon. Instead, the poor boy actually ran off another cliffside, slipped and fell and busted his head upon a rock. The bodies were found the next spring by tree trimmers trying their best to clear the roads after that foul weather. No one could rightly explain how it was that the first boy lost his head, so they hired a medium named Sabrina Maywester. Maywester had gotten some acclaim from a nearby company helping form a seance, and the town folks asked her to do the same for the boys. She told me that it was difficult to lie to them and tell them that the boys had simply faced terrible accidents. People want safe and comforting fairy tales. That's why they tell their parents about Santa. They don't want to confront the possibility of the supernatural. Don't you believe that that ghost of the hunter may still be out there, hunting others? I asked her. It's almost Christmas, so I'm sure of it. I placed some flowers on the boys' graves to remember them, but I'm afraid I don't think I can ever get so close to a case again. I felt eyes upon me at the cemetery, as though a spectral force was watching me from beyond. It is my belief that as I gather these clues, I am inciting a dark force to come to my door. But there's no turning back when I know there are more dangerous and cosmic terrors ahead. The search for truth demands I face this fear. I have humbly asked Maywester to stay in contact with me, though. Should anything happen, it will be her duty to relay these messages to the living. Something tells me I will come close to needing her services very soon.
Dear listener, Christmas Eve has always had a special place in my heart. The children go to bed early. The streets become empty. There isn't a light on for miles, and often you can stare into the stars. That actually isn't the reason at all why I enjoy it, but I figured that if I painted a warm and cozy scene, you might forget for a brief moment that the majority of my research focuses on the supernatural. The actual reason that I enjoy Christmas Eve is because the veil between worlds often is lifted early to begin celebrating the mingling of souls. And that means a chance to observe paranormal occurrences is heightened. Is this odd? Quite likely. But then again, I don't recall asking for your opinion either. Bloodbath. Most people who work for Thornton and Hewley likely never knew how eccentric or outlandish their CEO was. Jessica Aolin wasn't so lucky. She ran a catering company in the area. The law office decided to hire her for a Christmas Eve party a few years back. For Jessica, she thought that it would be easy money. There were a lot of people there from all around the entire city. I guess I never realized how many people work for Mr. Dalen. For the event, Dalen had requested a variety of dishes. None of them seemed particularly festive, but I knew it was common for a lot of people to forget the reason for the season. Jessica said that she made only five of the dishes on the list, given that she had been hired at such short notice. I didn't know this at the time, but I was basically sloppy seconds. All the other bigger caterers had already been called and refused. I wish I had known what they knew about Dalen and his company. When she got there to the party, most of the law firm was already drunk. Dalen was requesting that the main dishes be served at the 16th floor conference room, and Jessica had her hands full. It really didn't surprise me to realize that she had no idea what was actually going on there. My research has found that this particular law office was well known for another reason, though. Mr. Dalen had extremely morbid fascinations with the occult. Perhaps it might even have rivaled mine. And before Jessica arrived that evening... The head of the company had requested that all of his senior executives gather at the conference room and begin a supernatural ritual to contact the dead. Yes, Dalen wanted them to perform a seance. He had even hired a medium to make sure the ritual went off without a hitch. Jessica, meanwhile, was walking into this shadowy conference room offering eggnog and warm roast beef, unaware of the fact that her world was about to change forever. As you may or may not be aware, tampering with the unnatural order of the astral plane is dangerous, especially if you don't know what you're doing. The medium hired was only a two-year novice, having mostly gained fame from local small towns, proclaiming details about missing persons and long-lost husbands. The stories were accurate. The ghosts always told the truth. But this sort of seance was something entirely new to her, and the ritual did not go as planned. There was a shudder that shook the entire company. Some claimed that it was an earthquake, but I've checked records. No seismic activity could be found that day. What happened over the next few hours, though, That can't be argued by anyone who lived nearby. The lawyers suddenly became extremely violent towards each other. Jessica said that she was able to serve Mr. Dalen a slice of meatloaf when he started to foam at the mouth. His eyes rolled back, and he sounded like he was possessed. It didn't take a stretch of the imagination to realize... That was precisely what was happening. He and his entire board of directors had unwittingly unleashed a swarm of angry spirits. The power went out shortly after this, and these well-dressed businessmen turned on each other without hesitation. 
using everything within reaching distance as a weapon. Jessica showed me a wound where Dalen actually bit her arm, and described to me in detail how others used chairs and fire extinguishers to bash at one another. I stumbled toward the back of the room, where that damn medium was trying to escape and demanded that she help me. She grabbed my arm and... We crawled through the carnage. When they reached the elevator, the two of them were attacked one last time by an accountant. He was spitting angry, toxic fire from his eyes and mouth, every trace of his human appearance melting away. The ghost wanted one final victim. The medium said that she invoked a binding spell, a last-ditch attempt to stop the evil spectral force. Somehow, it worked. They rode to the ground floor and ran to find the nearest phone to contact the police. By the time the authorities had arrived, all of the people in the building had finished slaughtering one another. I came to retrieve my items from my company. It was horrendous. Eyes were scattered on the floor, people mutilated from fingernails, spine tissue dangling on stairs. I've never seen such carnage before. I believe there's more to the story than just a warning of tampering with the unknown. These spirits were angry for a reason. A brief look into the accounting books of the company have told me what may be the answer. The company purchased an entire city not long back. It had fallen on hard times and they needed money, but they didn't take into account an old curse. It hadn't been lifted, the medium told me. In case you hadn't realized, she was the same person who assisted me to know what befell Simon and Raoul. Now, it was occurring to me that the ghost stories I thought may not be connected actually had a deeper meaning to one another. The answer was there, at Harbor Bay. Dark forces seemed to have a habit of circling the area. They even followed me, perhaps because of all that I've uncovered. But still, I must know more. I guess you know where I'll be spending Christmas. If I make it, until then, I mean... Dear listener, wherever you are, whatever you may be doing, I humbly ask you to stop and look around at the people you are surrounded by. Are you with family, friends, workmates, strangers? If your answer is yes to any of those, you should consider yourself fortunate. My Christmas will not be so bright. There aren't any children I am hurrying home to, or even friends I need to call and wish a happy holiday. These connections are long gone for me. All that remains are the memories of a life I tossed away in the pursuit of knowledge. Where did it get me? Surprising, or perhaps not so much so, depending on your worldview. Not very far. Old Man Aster. I've seen pictures of abandoned places before, but it felt entirely different driving over the countryside and stepping into what was literally a ghost town. I could feel the spirit's eyes on me as I drove in, looking for any signs of life. I had dozens of questions that needed to be answered, and all of them seemed to lead here to this lonesome lake town. I've gathered so many stories that connect to Harbor Bay, 
I'm beginning to think that maybe my own story is somehow linked to this place. Soon enough, I was in the town square, where Raya claimed that she had laid down flowers before moss-covered statues. The entire place was dilapidated, with roots growing out from the streets and vines covering every window and door. Not exactly the most welcome place to spend Christmas morning. And the statues were almost entirely broken apart, as though someone had come by and smashed them to bits. A drive down the road showed me what had happened. Bulldozers from the accounting firm were in the streets, rusted and pushing back debris. Clearly, Thornton's business had tried in vain to rekindle a spark of life here, but the forces from beyond had decided that they wanted to keep a hold of it. What made this place so special, I wondered, as I moved up to the richer districts. It occurred to me that Lisa Landry had likely once called this place her home before she married. Would I possibly meet her spectral husband again? Surprisingly, instead, I met an old man that looked like he was a part of the scenery. He resembled a hunter, a sportsman that was moving about the ruins in search of a kill. When he saw me, I suspected that he was sizing me up to decide if I was prey. You've come a long way, the old man said. His voice sounded colder than any winter I'd ever endured. I thought back to May Wester and her warning about this charming fellow. I knew immediately who this had to be. Old man Aster, I take it, I asked. In the flesh, so to speak. But I don't think you came here to meet me, he said, with a gleam in his eye mischievous and dangerous. I kept my distance and raised a firearm that I had brought with me. Truth be told, I'm not sure why. I knew that being dead it would do no good, but Aster still seemed shocked by my fears and violent spirit. It's Christmas! Is that really the way you want to spend the most blessed day of the year? Aster asked. I came for answers. I quit playing games, I ordered. Aster raised his hands defensively and grabbed his cane, pointing toward a slope where I saw the old cemetery. All of your needless searching will lead you there, boy, he told me. I turned to look at the old gravestones, feeling a sense of foreboding take hold. What was he leading me towards? My feet seemed to move of their own accord up the hill, desperate to understand. It was nearly midday when I got to the graveyard, alone and forgotten by everyone that ever cared for it. There weren't many headstones, but all of them told a story or two. Families slain by guardian angels that had once overlooked Harbor Bay. Husbands that were murdered by greedy wives for fame and fortune. Sons that were slaughtered by cold winter. There was an air of dread over every unfortunate soul that had come here. And then... Then I saw a tombstone that bore my own name. And I felt altogether taken aback with shock. At first I ignored the obvious and thought maybe this was a Christmas trick. Like what Dickens had written about. A warning from beyond to fix my life, otherwise I would wind up here, forgotten by everyone I had ever cared for, or perhaps forgotten by the world entirely, like all of the other ghosts that had haunted this place. Instead, reading the inscription there on the stone had enlightened me to a story of my own life, a story I had forgotten. My name was Henry Landry. I was the husband of a beautiful wife, Liza, and the father of two amazing children, Simon and Raoul. 
The town of Harbor Bay had fallen on hard times. A dreadful businessman named Howard Dalen had purchased the entire town with the intention of modernizing it, but not long after went bankrupt, he committed suicide. As a result, the poor fools in Harbor Bay sunk into poverty. People turned on one another one particularly dangerous winter, neighbors slaughtering each other when they realized some of the townsfolk were actually hoarding food underneath Father Strom's church. My wife and I we tried to find food and power as the winter got worse, but then we hit a strip of black ice. And I... I died instantly. My boys managed to crawl out, only to later get lost in the woods and die of starvation. Liza was the lucky one, having gotten EMTs to save her. Her entire life changed in a single instance. My life insurance paid for her mansion, her decadent lifestyle, and helped her to forget about me and the boys. It was this callous attitude that brought me back to this world, to make her pay for what she had done. It occurred to me now that the ghost I had seen at her estate was simply my own reflection, trying to help me piece together the forgotten tapestry of my memories. All of this came crashing down as I turned to see old man Aster gazing at me thoughtfully. He didn't seem as dangerous or vile as before. His clothes were clad in white. Like an angel might have. And he smiled at me and said, It's time to rejoin your family in heaven, Henry. I looked down at the graves still torn apart at how much of my life had been taken away. But knowing my purpose in this world was fulfilled, and the stories of those who I had connected with was now told. I agreed with him. I made but one request, which you know of now, listener. As a spirit, it would be impossible for me to create these memoirs and have them be told, so I made clear that the recordings be given to Sabrina Maywester. She was, after all, the psychic she claimed to be, having used her services in the past to expose charlatans like Dalen and my wife. If you are hearing this now, that means that she followed my own Christmas wish and relayed the information to others so that these ghost stories can live on. This is where my own tortured soul now rests. But that doesn't mean that the other spirits can be quieted. Which is why I remind you of my original request. Tell tales of those who have passed on. Otherwise, we may still haunt you forevermore. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and it's the end of today's video, or today's episode of the podcast, which means I want to tell you guys, thank you so much for watching. And thank you for hitting like, and subscribe, and bell, and I think it's still subscribe on podcasts. One day I'll look that up. If you guys are listening on your phone, like I think the statistics say like 90% of you are, then on your phone you can also listen on another place. It's an app called Chilling. The Chilling app allows you to listen to stories from me, but you can't get here, as well as stories from a whole group of other narrators. A lot of them you've heard before, some of them you've even heard here, like Autumn Ivy. Plus, it allows you to control the background music and background ambiance, which I think is probably one of the coolest features on there. Check out Chilling on Android and iOS now. I want to give a very big thank you to everybody on Patreon, especially Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Brian Arse, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Robert Schonkwiller, USMC, Matt Bach, Jables Raz, Masked Note, Joshua Mullen, Dan Pham, Matthew McNeese, Ben Spates, Jeremy H, 
Raltazal, Ficamel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Mara Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Ares, Isodo Hatred, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Sazaku, at Grizzly Olsen Pro, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Jay, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday, Jason Willis, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, and Corey Kenshin. Like I said, I, I cannot thank you guys enough for being a part of this, and that goes to everybody down there in the description, and everybody who even can just support for one dollar. Thank you guys, thank you guys, thank you guys. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday season, and sweet dreams.